while we're just getting organized, we definitely need a little high table here for sure. But that's coming somewhere sometime. Um, if we can maybe throw my screen up here. I don't even know how to do all that. Um, can I just say a huge thank you? You know, the nature of our little community, I think on our MailChimp we've got a hundred and something people who we send out to on a weekly basis, who loosely call Genesis home somewhere in some way. Um, but in a summer time like this, it's a lot of work on a few people. And I can't express my gratitude sufficiently. Just to say thanks to those of you who put yourselves out to come and be, to make this happen. I mean, you know we're not fancy. We're not purposefully trying to be, I wouldn't even use the microphone, but we record it. And every now and again, I'm reminded of the value of it. Meryl and I had lunch this week with a, a couple. He's British, she's American, and they've been following our podcast for a few years. And you realize, okay, that's why we do it. My school teacher voice can throw this room easily, so that's not why we need that. I, in fact, find it a hindrance between you and me. But I want to say to Josh McDowell, wherever he is, he's been beast. He has honestly been absolutely beast. He's in a logistical way, he's put the church on his shoulders, this community, everything that needs to happen, and carried it. Mel Melanie, where are you, girl, as well? You know, just, just in the kitchen area, um, we, we, we don't have kind of families, we don't have lots of stuff. And uh, I have just been, whenever there's a gap, I'm always curious to see who steps up and fills it. Uh, not because they asked or obligated to, just because they want to. And I have been delighted beyond description. And there are others. Harris, I arrived here tonight at 5, and he and his team had set this up amazingly. Um, I think we, we will see how good we are in the next week as we see people coming back. Brian's in India. As I said, Kevin and Ariel, Daniel's been in Spain. I mean, people have been in so many different places and the students, Vanguard, will come back. Biola will come back. Uh, other non-college people will come back from their vacations and trips. And I think it will be fun to see how we squeeze into this space and to make it happen. And um, I am so incredibly, incredibly proud. There isn't a day that goes by that I don't thank the Lord for an incredible privilege of leading this community. I, um, I feel daily, Meryl will tell you, inept. Every day I feel like my age is at least one, two generations away from you. My culture, moved here when I was 38, uh, I'm at least one culture away from you. And uh, somehow there's love and trust in the room for us to do this, this adventure of faith. And um, I am privileged every single day, write in my journal, pray my prayers, and just voice my deep gratitude to the Lord for the adventure that we are having. Thank you, really, from the bottom of my heart for trusting us and for buying into a story of uncertainty. I think I was thinking about the crew that, um, that are in South Africa right now, and next Sunday we'll just have stories. We'll just have, we'll give everyone time to feedback and to tell stories, and it'll be great to hear. Um, but I think those who were on the trip will be able to say, okay, now we understand what you're on about. Now they will have eaten the food I eat, they would have been in the churches that we helped plant way back when. They would have uh, gone into game park, a game park and so on. And it will be very, very wonderful. I said to the interns when they started out with me two years ago, I don't have much to give. But what I do have, one of them is a global story. And I will put you in a global space. And uh, David and them come back and then they go, David and them, sounds like David and Goliath. And then they go to Thailand in September. We have a trip, a team going to Dubai and Beirut in November. In February, we have a trip to, Ist to Istanbul, Tunisia, and to Hyderabad, India. And then the newest one, which I want to throw out and seed you with, it's happened amazingly, is that next July, we will have a, an International Young Leaders Summit in Portugal. Now... Just think about it for a moment. We're a bunch of small churches globally. This is not a sexy big gig. But um, when I looked at the teams that were with us in Denver in the prayer tour, 
when uh, in South Africa, there were two groups in South Africa, and I just said, Lord, this is something that you're percolating amongst the young. And uh, this idea began to percolate inside of me. What about doing an International Young Leaders Summit? And I have to say, okay, here's the cheeky, naughty part of me. But the thought of having 200 young leaders in the room and how many of them will fall in love and get married is way too curious for me. I mean, just that alone is like, let's pull off a conference. It's almost like Viola, you know, the Bridal Institute of Los Angeles. It's like, let's have a summit and see what happens. But on the, on the other side of that will be people, men and women. That's what Mar happened to Meryl and I. We were this little South African church couple leading a church at the first time at about two or 300 people. And we went into a global space and God changed our lives. And um, so I've already spoken to Taylor. He's interested to come and help in the conversation around entrepreneurs. Nat, Nate Dorman, who was a professional surfer, now leads a church plant in Huntington Beach. I've said to him, can you do a surf safari front end, three days surfing Portugal. He is super amped. Cedric is in the island of Mauritius. He was the number one surfer there, sponsored, and then decided to, to be a youth pastor. So he's going to co-lead that. Three days of surfing, three days of, of uh, conversation and ideation around biblical entrepreneurship. And then while I'm wrestling with all this, a friend of mine calls me and he says, you won't believe it. He said, but uh, we've got a young couple who want to plant in Lisbon, Portugal, Lisboa. And I said, well, you're absolutely, and I told him, about, I said, Raw, this is nuts. I said, uh, so we are looking to do this event. When are they looking to go? I said, let me guess, they're going in January. He said, absolutely. I said, let me guess, they're going to take six months to settle in, and then you're going to launch. He said, yes. I said, well, we've got 200 people who are going to be ready to help them launch. <laughs> so three days surfing, three days entrepreneurial ideation, Three days helping a, a church plant take place. Isn't that a good idea? Yeah. So uh, all these wonderful things happen. And uh, I just marvel at God's goodness, you know. It just is fabulous. Grab your Bibles, please. Um, I want to open up to Ephesians chapter 5. This is just a little fun mini-series. As you know, I'm a history nerd, so I love studying history. Um, I actually had a, a really nutty moment the other day, and I went online to one of the universities to see if I could do my master's in church history. And of course, Meryl came back and just shook her head. It's another idea I've got. What's that? No, I know you did, my love. You're very kind. Okay, so what are we trying to do? We did a mini-series on Ephesians in the spring. The primary reason was not a great exegetical experience. I knew that. It was to begin to allow some of the young men and women who are teachers in our ranks, sadly only a few, but to give them opportunity to teach or co-teach with me uh, and using Ephesians as the foundation for our faith. One of the prophetic words spoken over this church by Scott, what's his name? Ian, um, Alan. Alan Scott, who now leads the vineyard down the road. He prophesied over us that this season we will see many teachers emerge from our little community. And I just amen that. So we've got to help percolate that space. That's the one thing, is let's revisit Ephesians. Let's look at the great pictures of the church in such an exquisite book, my favorite book, as an epistle. And then back end, we went through the Lord's Prayer because we want to raise the tone of prayer in our community. We want it to be the instinct, the first responders. When anything happens, we pray. Funny little story, uh, T's moving into some mates in Point Loma, San Diego, and uh, in the room that they're sharing, there's one bed. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. Sufficient to say, I say, come on, let's just see what God provides. I send an email out to some friends in, in uh, San Diego, and we got three beds. Just boom. But the one was the super fancy, brand new bed. And uh, I just, when he woke up this morning, I stuck my phone in his face saying, look at God's provision. And I think he was still trying to see straight. Look at God's provision. God is a prayer answerer. And we just got to position ourselves. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. It's not a mantra for crazy nutty Christians. It's a truth that reflects the Father's heart in a most exquisite way. So we look at a picture of the church. We're trying to keep the tide of prayer increasing in our church. And in the middle of that, tell a story. So... That's what we're going to do tonight. Ephesians chapter 5, please. And uh, we will pick up in verse 17. 
Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with all of your heart. Don't you love the, the usness of that verse? Sp sing to each other, speak to each other, uh, making melody in your, in, to the Lord in your heart, giving thanks always for everything to the Lord in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord, for the Lord is the head of the wife. Sorry, the husband. Is the, that was a Freudian slip. The Lord is the head of the wife. <laughs> Sorry, it was just my distorted humor. Even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to everything in their husband. That is a beautiful word. It's not a scary word. We're not going to get into that tonight, sadly. I think it is an exquisite word because it, gives, it finds its meaning in the next verses. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Which wife doesn't want to submit to a husband who loves? In other words, submission means to partner with, to love, to be loved by, and a husband who gives himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and blameless. I think I'm going to stop there for the sake of it. What I want to do this evening, and we're going to pray, is I want to look at the bride, the Catholic, and the spirit. How does that sound? The bride, the Catholic, and the spirit. Help us now, Lord. We, we are here because we're zealous for you. We're eager and we are hungry. Yeah. We want more of you. We want to understand you. We want to know our God. We want to understand the whistles and the wind of your spirit. We want to be fully surrendered and submitted to Father God. We want to know the intimate affection of the groom. We want to know the power and presence of your Holy Spirit. And so we can go on. And you robe it all off in community. And that is your kindness. So I ask right now, Lord, in the next, I don't know, 25 minutes or so, would you help me to articulate to the best that I can this incredible story? But more importantly, will you take those little verses, words, phrases, and pop life into all of our hearts? I pray especially for those who are hurting and limping tonight. I was last week. Someone else's turn this week. And may we emerge out of the cocoon of, our, of your presence, stirred, refreshed, robed with courage, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. It is funny to speak of the bride as a man, because obviously I've never been one. I don't have any plans to be one. But I have had the privilege of seeing Meryl as a young 18-year-old walk down the aisle. We had just written our final, she her, she her freshman year of college, I just finished my fifth year at college, which sounds very glamorous, but I had to repeat one year because I found it so much fun that the university invited me back to redo it. They felt, you know, you had so much fun. Why did you just do it again? So I did. And, uh, and we got married a week later. I did, however, have the privilege of walking my two daughters down the aisle and uh, being in the behind the scenes. This afternoon, I was just praying mulling over the little images clear in my mind of, of Nas, whom you'll meet. My eldest daughter will be in December. And uh, you will meet her. And I remember sitting with uh, us holding hands. We had an outdoor wedding um, up at the uh, City of Industry Hotel, right up high. And we sat in a friend's infinity. And we just held, it wasn't time for words. Words were irrelevant. But I'd watched the buildup of my 18-year-old who finished high school in May and got married in September. And I remember distinctively high point moments of the, the months that built up. Just a few months of choosing a dress for her in South Africa. It just happened that way. Of her bridesmaids, of her mother's involvement, of this tiny, cute, petite little girl. And I'm thinking to myself, that's a big moment to walk a daughter down the aisle. And then when I looked at her, I said, it's time, baby. And she said, yes, it is. And her big brown eyes popped out like this, this mop of blonde hair. And we walked out. We got out the car and walked to the front. And as we got to the front 
and they were all, I think about 300 people, love, 200 people, whatever it was. And it was outdoors, and there was kind of a, a red carpet that uh, did an L-shaped, like all these white chairs, beautiful, beautiful autumn day. Um, and uh, as we got around the front of the car, she said, Dad, when we get to the L part of the, of the carpeting, she says, I have something for you. And we walked, and it was very moving, very powerful. She said, I don't want you to do the wedding. I want you to be my dad, which was fine. And as we got to that part, she looked at me with the big brown eyes, and she said, Dad, can I dance with you one more time? And uh, Josh Groban's You Lift Me Up was playing, and we held each other, and we both wept as we danced together one last time as Nasia Vinant, soon to become Nasia Tapping, why I do not know. And um, uh, one of my friends said, it's the wedding where more men cried than women. And I think I, I know why. But, but the build-up to it, her, her mum, her sister, her granny, her aunties, her bridesmaids, uh, the wedding, kind of soft wedding planner. We didn't do a high wedding planner thing. And, um, and then Dana, of course, just the, the sheer excitement. And I can tell you story after story of God's provision and the dress and her bridesmaids and aunties and grannies. And Dana said, I'll do, I said, I'll get dressed barefoot on a beach if I could have my grandparents here. Mara, Dana's great affection for her two sets of grandparents. And uh, by God's miracle, because they both retired and actually kind of poor, and God made a way for them to come out to L.A. from South Africa to be here. And, I mean, I can tell you story after story of God's provision of venue. And Meryl and I had a little bit of money. We're we, we obviously not really wealthy. And, and God's provision of having this ceremony and celebration in downtown L.A. It's a great story, actually. The place fell through that we were supposed to do it in. And uh, the caterer, a friend of ours, who kind of does cater high end, like the mayor of L.A. kind of guy, caters for him. Uh, he said to me, look, I, I, just wait. And he came back, Steve did, and he, he called me back. He, he came into the room and he said, look, I don't know if this is going to work, but he said, I've called in a favor, does whatever the address is. Yeah, in La Brea, downtown. And, and Dana looked in her, her big brown eyes and she said, actually, Dad, that was the first venue I looked at, but it was too expensive, so I didn't even come to you. And they gave, they happened to, they said, we don't know why, but it's free that night. And they gave it to us for a fraction of the price. I mean, just story after story after story. Now, why am I telling you those? Because I think Father God loves the notion of the church as a bride. I think, I think we miss it. I think we miss the imagery. We miss the imagination. We miss the sense of wonder. When Mary walked down the aisle, the sense of wonder. When Nas walked down the aisle, when Dana walked down the aisle, the sense of wonder. As I looked into my future son-in-law's eyes, at this, is, this shall be the bride, my future. And I think Jesus never loses that sense of wonder. Now, of course, there were the moments, oh, gosh, there's a zit, you know, can I get rid of the zit before Saturday? You know, there are all those little things where we're very aware of our pimples and, our, you know, do we need Dr. Pimple to come and do, the, do what she does best, you know? I don't know if you know, but it's a thing. And um, all of that, but, and I think God continues to be mesmerized. We look at the pimple and it's a meltdown, you know, what, and my girls would really like it, but, but can you, God, what's going to happen to me? Look at this, look at that, what, what do they think? How can I cover it over? And Jesus, the great groom, who sweeps us off our feet. He mesmerizes us with his majesty and his purity and his strength and his wonder and his power. And while we, but, 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 but what about this about me? And what about that about me? And, and don't you know how weak and vulnerable and uncertain and downy? And I don't know if I should marry you. And he still comes and picks us up. And he still comes and loves us. And he still comes and embraces us. Because this is not an illustration by some moment of weakness by Paul in prison. What he's doing is he's reminding us of the intense, irresistible, unconditional love of Christ on us broken, mortal, limited, weak human beings. And the best analogy he can find is you are like my bride. The climactic moment of scripture, Revelations, is all about him, the groom, and us, the bride. Revelation 19, 7, let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and the bride has made herself ready. Ladies, use your imaginations. I don't know what to recommend to you guys, 
but use the imaginations that you have of just exactly how compelling and captivating it was. I think of Isaac and Rebecca. A servant is sent to go and find him a bride. She arrives and she is fully covered. He can't see. If I was Isaac, I would be thinking, oh my word, is this a dud or what? I mean, like, what is this? Will he come back? I mean, will the servant come back with what? And they had an exquisite marriage. Never met her. Didn't say, oh, I I think I love you. He loved her and she loved him. And the little we know of their marriage, it was a beautiful marriage. Revelation 21, 2, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. The hair is done. The makeup is done. However you imagine it, this is what I've seen. The dress curviously crafted to fit her form. The jewelry enough to create a sparkle but not enough to dominate. The shoes enough to appear invisible but to make her feet as they should look beautiful. How lovely are the feet of him who bring good news. And then that moment, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let the one who hears say, come. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is, in the limited time I have, my ability to articulate the wonder that Jesus feels about you and me. We struggle with that image because oftentimes we put on ourselves the image of perfection. The only perfect one is him. The only one without any sense of breakage, brokenness, weakness, fault, flaw is him. He is the one who sweeps us off our feet. I said to my girls, make sure that your husband loves you a little more than you love him. So when I looked at Mark, when I looked into Stu's eyes and we sat in that pub in the Thames, London, I wanted to see that he loves my daughter just a little bit more than she loves him. For the sake of time, I have to scramble, but I want to take you to this woman. Tragically, we evangelicals don't do the Catholics enough justice. There have been some remarkable Catholic Jesus lovers. And I realized as I started studying this idea that A, I wanted to engage a woman's story. B, the only one I could think of was Dorothy Day. How many of you have heard of her? Just out of interest. She was born in November 1897 in Brooklyn, New York. Now, for those of you history nerds like me, that gives you context. Her dad took a job in San Francisco in 1906, just before the earthquake. And let me just pause to give you this, but I want to take a moment with that San Francisco experience. She died in November 29, uh, oops, 19, (laughs) 1980. She lived, she lived a negatively long time. (laughs) Hey, I'm trying, okay, I'm trying. This is my John Mark impersonation. Give me some grace here. Pope Benedict the, the 16th or something said, that she was a room, an example of how a journey towards faith can be found in a secular, secularized society. Pope Francis said, included her in his short list of exemplary Americans. Listen to her company, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, and Thomas Merton. Why did she have such high accolades? What was it about her story that made her such a compelling woman? And just to go back to her picture, I actually find her stunningly attractive. If you think this was probably around about, um, I'm going to guess and say she was about 25 to 30, that would put her in uh, just before the First World War, just afterwards, 1917. They said she was stunning. Tall, lithe, incredibly attractive. 
I want to highlight five moments in her life, and you will understand then why I've chosen her in the light of this experience. The first was 1906 in San Francisco, when the great earthquake hit San Francisco and nearly flattened the city. Now, the tragedy was her parents got hold of all the other siblings and left her inside. And she writes with great eloquence of what it felt like as this build, as their building basically shook and everything fell out of the closets, but she felt left behind. One author, Paul Ellie, said, a whole life is prefigured in that episode. The crisis, the sense of God's nearness, the awareness of poverty. People rallied together after the earthquake. Everyone lost kind of everything. The feeling that she had and lived with her the rest of her life of loneliness and abandonment, but also the sense that loneliness can be filled by love and community, especially through solidarity with those in deepest need. That deeply fashioned her. Poverty fashioned her. The sense of a community rallying around brokenness fashioned her. The sense of people clubbing together and collaborating fashioned her. The second thing, she was given a full ride scholarship to the University of Illinois, one of the subsidiary ones whose name I don't have right now. But listen to this intriguing story for about 10 years. She joined the Writers Club, she joined the Socialist Party and broke from any form of religion. She went to war with society. Malcolm Cowley, one of the biographers, wrote that gangsters loved her because she could drink them under the table. And she was... Lean, skinny. She had a friend die in her arms after a heroin overdose as she and others dabbled with drugs. And her promiscuous way, she wrote in her autobiography, the sadness of sin, the unspeakable dreariness of sin. She was arrested twice. 1917, during the suffragette movement, she protested, picketed the White House. And she with the other, I think there were 40 of them, if my memory serves me right, were arrested together. And it was, it was um, when they went onto a, a fast that they were released and never charged. The second time had a greater impact upon her. It was five years later. She was 22 years old. She was living a debauched life with all these artists, bohemian styles, the communists, and um, she says the night of her second arrest, the cops came actually for political reasons, but she was so flimsy and so intoxicated by her lifestyle that they arrested her as a prostitute, which she never was. She said it led to a time of intense self-criticism and self-scrutiny. Now, what I'm trying to do with all of this is not fill your head purely with information. I'm wanting you and I to understand that all of us have a story. And some of these stories make us. San Francisco made her. Her bohemian lifestyle made her because she had to see what it produced, what became of it. She had an affair with a man called Lionel Moyes. And when she got pregnant, he got her to have an abortion. It led her to call that the most, the greatest tragedy of her life. It led to a failed attempted suicide. Someone came in just at the right time. Thirdly, San Francisco, her bohemian lifestyle, thirdly. She met an atheist, a very interesting man, she calls British, David Brooks questions that in his biography on her, called Foster Batterham. From what we gather, he was a very compelling man. I listened to an interview with Dorothy Day's granddaughter about her grandpa. Very compelling man. She had written a book, um, Dorothy Day had, called The, the 11th, the 11th, um, the 11th Virgin. She said it was a very bad book. But she made some money from it and went to bought a little house 
on the beach where she would go and write and he would join her for weekends. They were, had a common law arrangement, but she too became pregnant. He was not a happy man. He demanded that she have an abortion that she refused, thinking she would never be able to have a baby anyway. She wrote in one of her accounts that hardly ever is preg- uh, birth giving the whole labor process written by woman. Normally it's written by men. So she decided to document it, and this is what she wrote. Earthquake and fire swept my body. My spirit was a battleground in which thousands were butchered in a most horrible manner. Through rush and roar of the cataclysm, which was all about me, I heard the murmur of the doctor and answered the murmur of the nurse in my head. In a white blaze of thankfulness, I knew ether was forthcoming. But then her daughter was put in her arm, her daughter of Tamar. This is what she said. Now remember, San Francisco, bohemian lifestyle. She's in a common relationship with an atheist. She's a socialist hanging out with communists. She has no faith. She wrote this. If I had written the greatest book, composed the greatest symphony, painted the most beautiful painting or carved the most exquisite figure, I could not have felt more, uh, the more exalted creator than I did when they placed my child in my arms. No human creature could receive or contain so vast a flood of love and joy as I often felt after the birth of my child. With this came the need to worship and to adore. David Brooks in his biography on her then goes on, and I just don't have time to describe how she worshiped. It was that moment that, it, that, that, that the existence of God was no longer her question. The question was, how do I worship him? How do I worship him? Not who do I worship? When that little baby was put into her arms, and those little eyes, as I've seen oh so many times, and little Dana's and Stu's baby, when that little one comes, that look, that kind of cowering look, are you the voice I've heard for so long? I love the baby in the womb. I love talking to them, holding them, speaking to them. With each one of my kids, from the time we knew that there was life, God had breathed life into that womb. My pleasure and joy was sometimes humorously, sometimes soberly, sometimes in music and song, sometimes in just fervent speech, so that when they come out, they're looking, who is the voice that shaped me in the womb? It's the most exquisite moment. And it was that moment that defined the beginning of a spiritual life for her. David Brooks wrote, the birth of her child began a transformation from a scattered person to a centered person, from an unhappy bohemian to a woman who had found her calling. Thank you for being gracious. Fourthly, her relationship with Foster was now in crisis. I want you to hear this. This to me is sublime honesty. Because you see, I think every one of us has that one or more relationships that when we say yes to Jesus, our groom, it comes at a price tag that someone we love, we have to walk away from. She loved Foster. She wanted to marry him. She wanted to have a home for Tamar. He refused to consider such a bourgeois lifestyle. In fact, he gave her an ultimatum. Me, me, or him, Jesus. She could not leave the Jesus she had fallen in love with. He walked out a very graphic moment. They sat across the way from the table. He put his hands on the table like this, and he listened to her, and he ranted and he raved. And when he had finished ranting, she looked at him with a quiet voice. And he said, why have you done this? You're mentally disturbed. What are you trying to do? And she said quietly, it is Jesus. I guess it is Jesus Christ, the one pushing me to the Catholics. He stormed off, absolutely furious. He loved her. She loved him. Deeply. But what I find so compelling, and that's why I wanted this story, is that she was the bride and there was no greater suitor. There was no one more compelling 
more amazing, more lovely. And she loved this guy. Do you know what she wrote to him even after he left her? This came out after she died. Someone, they found some letters. And Kate Hennessy speaks about feeling quite illegitimate reading the letters that her mom, her granny had sent to her grandpa. I love the honesty. She writes to the man who rejected her because of Jesus. She said, I dream about you every night. That I'm lying in your arms and I can feel your kisses and it's torture to me. But so sweet too. I do love you more than anything else in the world, but I cannot help my religious sense which tortures me unless I do the right thing. I dream about you every night. That I'm lying in your arms, I can feel your kisses, and it's torture for me. She said it was through a whole love, both physical and spiritual, that I came to know God. She became the bride. I don't know, man, I'd love to have met her. That she had such a revelation of him as groom. And nothing else mattered. After Foster, she never loved another man and remained celibate the rest of her life. She wrote, It was years before I awakened without the longing for a face pressed against my breast, an arm about my shoulder. The sense of loss was there. It was the price I paid. Can I read that again? It was years before I awakened without the longing for a face pressed against my breast an arm around my shoulder, the sense of loss was there. It was the price I paid. I don't know of a more compelling story, comparatively maybe to Mother Teresa, but she went in at 12 and knew that she would join the the sisters of whatever in Ireland. This was a girl who had known love. She had known many men. She'd slept around. She had known affection and distortion and perception. And, and it was in the, in, in the, in the beauty of, of, of her life as a, as a stunning woman that she said, there's one who loves me more and with whom I have a greater affection. Fifthly, this is my last major point. Sorry, I feel, I feel stirred by these stories, man, of her walking, her life's message. She said, we should live in such a way that our lives wouldn't make much sense if the gospel is not true. We should live our lives in such a way that our lives would not, sorry, we should live in such a way that our lives would not make much sense if the gospel were not true. She started a Catholic newspaper as a voice for the poor and unrepresented. And she said, the only answer in this life to the loneliness we all abound to feel is community. Now, this is the one that catches me, folks. And thank you for being so gracious. She started hospitality homes for the poor, homeless, the addict, the broken, the prostitute. And she writes because she went to live there with her daughter. She said the work was relentless. Breakfast, a thick slice of bread, some bad coffee, and I dictate a dozen letters. My brain is a fog. I'm too weak to climb stairs. I prescribe for myself a day in bed, but I'm thinking in my spirit that's all wrong. I'm surrounded by repellent disorder, noise, people, and have no spirit of inner solitude or poverty. We look at these people in a saintly way and we forget how human they really were. She was an introvert. She was an author. She wanted to be in her beach house with her baby, writing her books. Another quote. Going to bed at night with a foul smell of unwashed bodies. Lack of privacy. But Jesus, she says, listen to this, was born in a manger and a stable 
that was apt to be unclean and odorous. If the blessed mother can endure it, why can't I? She said, I only really love God as much as I love the person I love the least. Isn't that compelling? If we love each other enough, we will bear with each other's faults and with each other's burdens. I mean, honestly, I could spend hours here talking about Dorothy Day. But I want to land with a quote, one of her final quotes. She said, I try to think back. I try to remember this life that the Lord gave me. The other day I wrote down the words, we're talking about a journalist and an author. I wrote down the words, a life remembered. And I was going to make a summary for myself and write what matters most, but I couldn't do it. I just sat there and thought of our Lord and his great visit to us all those centuries ago. And I said to myself, my great luck was to have him on my mind for so long in my life. Why have I spoken of her? I find her life compelling. I find her by words and by lifestyle far more apt to describe what it looks like to be the bride of Christ where only the groom matters. Two stories and we'll pray. Meryl and I have done many weddings over the years. My saddest was a beautiful young girl in our community whose family lived in Zimbabwe, north of us, and there was no one to help her for her wedding. We found out and we said, Karen, K- Carrie, will you come and stay with us the two nights before you get married in our guest room? She sewed her own dress. She made her own cake. She organized her own wedding. In fact, the morning of the wedding, she ran out of time. And we called Meryl's mum, who's a seamstress, to come and sew Carrie into her wedding dress. She was an hour late. She had no bridesmaids, no mother on the ground. One of our young guys kind of kept the congregation involved while we waited for Carrie's arrival. When she finally arrived, she looked absolutely stunning. She walked to the front. And as I walked them through her vows, it got to that part in the wedding where she honored her husband and basically vowed herself covenantly to him. And she couldn't finish. She stopped midway and wept, but like wept and wept and wept. By comparison, you might take my daughter or you take Haley, who is our most recent wedding, or even Rachel, who we did the wedding of, Meryl and I did the other day. Just the line of mothers involved, the bridesmaids involved, the weekend away with the bridesmaids. Because you see, to be a bride really gets done in a group, doesn't it? I mean, I, I'm amazed these days. You know, I used to go and have a drink. The night my bachelor party was a group of uh, uh, drinks with some friends, and they gave me way too much alcohol. It was all their fault. It wasn't mine. <laughs> and do you, do you know what I'm saying? It's, it's like, no, you don't dream of getting married by yourself. You, you don't dream. So, okay, well, I, you, you, generally speaking, unless there's some extenuating circumstances, you've got mothers and bridesmaids and wedding planners, and all of it fits together. Because being a bride only makes sense in community. Otherwise, what does it mean to be a bride? How do we land? I think, first and foremost, the question is obvious to you and to me. Is Jesus my number one affection? I'm not saying we should all go and live in hospitality houses and they've got hundreds all over the world now. They've got farms that they 
put these people in. I'm not saying we're all going to be that. What I am saying is that to be his bride, we are completely compelled by him. Nothing is more exquisite. No one is as captivating or so uh, mysterious. And I'm so completely drawn in sweet surrender to him. I can tell you of the weddings that haven't made it. I can tell you of the wedding I did. Early days, I wouldn't do it today. The opening speech at the reception, the groom gets up to speak. The wife tugs his leg and his comment was, there we go, she's already started nagging. And I thought to myself, they're going to get divorced. They did. Because there wasn't the sense of wonder, of wow, him to her, her to him. There wasn't that sense of I'm going to leave my relational world and I'm going to cleave to you the beautiful, beautiful imagery of the two becoming one in every way. That sense of unity and oneness that, that kind of do this glorious eternal dance of togetherness. That is what he longs for and that's what only satisfies us. I promise, dear friends, nothing else satisfies us. Nothing. Our second response is embracing our call, no matter what the cost. All of our calls have a cost. I have a group of friends that play golf every Monday afternoon in South Africa. And it may sound silly, but many a Monday afternoon I'd be sitting in my diamond bar house when we first moved here knowing that they were on the golf course, I knew exactly the, how they were going to smack talk each other. I knew exactly how they were in each other's ears. I knew which beers they would order at the end of the game. And I so wanted to be with them. And here I'm sitting alone and lonely in a city I don't want to live in. Every one of our calling has a cost. Ultimately, do you think she thought she would be honored. They wanted to make her a saint. In the Catholic Church, that's a big thing. Do you think when she started out with her first house and she slept at night with a smelly breath, she speaks of this one little girl, gorgeous girl, um, a college graduate, who used to come in drunk and jump into any man's bed and they fought to get her out of men's beds all the time. Every night. Are you with me? Every calling has a cost. What's yours and what's mine? And then lastly, thank you for being so kind. I'm sorry I've spoken so long. Only our prayers can sustain us. She said this, with prayer, one can go on cheerfully and even happily. Without prayer, how grim a journey. Would you close your eyes with me? Jesus, our hearts long to be that kind of bride to you. Honest, real, true, transparent. Awed and amazed that you would still come like a knight in a tattered bloody garment and pick us up off our feet and love us with such wholeness and completion and generosity that our words have no language to describe it. When her daughter was put on her chest, she had to worship. Such was the wonder on her lips. Now I ask, I don't know what part of tonight's talk met with whom or even the podcast, but can I ask, Lord, that you would speak as only a lover could, gentle whispers of affection and admiration, calling and beckoning us to a higher journey. Mm -hmm. 
It is a bit late. But I don't want to lose a moment. And if you want prayer, if you don't mind standing, and we'll get a few people around you. The temptation is to be more logistical than spiritual. If there's no one who stands, that's fine. But if there's someone who says, you know what, I actually need prayer, I need a prophetic word, I need ministry. Honest, transparent, real. You stand and some people will come and pray for you. We linger for just a moment, Lord, because of you. We're embarrassed by our humanity, but when we look in the face of grace, you are not. You beckon us to come as we are, and, and you do the rest.